This is the micro effect. The micro effect. www.themicroeffect.com. You take the blue pill. The story ends. You wake up in your bed and believe whatever you want to believe. You take the red pill. You stay in Wonderland. And I show you how deep the rabbit hole goes. There was a mighty nation, blessed above all of creation. It was a rare and precious pearl. Conceived in faith and liberty, home of the brave, land of the free. It was the envy of the world. But this shining city on a hill has turned from the Creator's will and let evil take control. Now the reckless men who lead them want to strip away their freedom and to steal their very soul. Now it's smoke and mirrors, switch and bait, criticize and confiscate and let the guilty walk away. In this once righteous, godly nation, in the halls of education, they forbid a child to pray. They say we need to spread the wealth. They pretend to guard the health of the feeble and the poor. While the hand they hold behind their back confuses and conceals the fact that the wolf is at the door. There's an unseen hand that pulls strings. Well, good morning, America. Good morning to the listeners of Connecting the Dots. And good morning to our Tuesday morning Connecting the Dots radio program. Uh, this morning I've got Bob Fanning, who is a previous guest on our show, and Bob is a financial uh, expert. He's been a bond trader. He's very involved in the financial markets. And also Charles Ortel, who has uh, headed the uh, forensic investigation into the Clinton Foundation. But uh, Charles is also a very accomplished uh, trader of his own right. He's had his own uh, fund that uh, that he has been involved with, as well as some of the biggest uh, financial funds in the country, uh, stock and uh, and bond trading. And uh, this morning we're going to be talking about what in the world is happening with the economy right now, and why are we seeing these huge swings in the stock market. And uh, what is, uh, are we being set up for a fall or what? And with that, uh, Bob, welcome to the show. And Charles, welcome to the show. Bob, I'll give you a, 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 a few minutes to briefly introduce yourself, and then we'll move on to Charles. Well, Dan, I'm uh, 68. I got licensed on Wall Street when I was 24, thanks to my father who, before me, who was a... Uh, a big broker with a brokerage firm by the name of White Weld, which was a white shoe investment banking firm, very similar to the white shoe investment investment banking firm, Dylan Reed, where Charles is from. And so uh, with that, uh, I was successful as a young broker, went down to the Chicago Board of Trade, became a member, and... Uh, Rather than gambling for a living, I uh, also served institutional hedge accounts uh, from the floor of the Chicago Board of Trade and wrote a daily market letter for my my uh, institutional investor uh, accounts. So I think that pretty much uh, summarizes my uh, experience in the financial markets. I also was a industrialist and I owned a company that uh, built uh, blast furnaces and incinerators and kilns. So anyway, that's too much about me. It's more well, about Bob, uh, I've, I've known you for a number of years and I've known the one thing that always stood out to me is your acumen when it comes to financial matters and that's why we're having this show today and it's why you were a guest on this show. And uh, Charles, I have the same uh, tremendous respect for your 
abilities, your integrity, and uh, certainly your knowledge base. And uh, uh, would you give our listeners maybe a quick uh, overview of uh, your background as well, and then we'll get into the discussion of the day. Sure, and thanks, Dan, and hi, Bob. Thanks for having me on the show. Uh, I, too, uh, started out on Wall Street at age 24, having just gotten out of business school, and went to the firm Dylan Reed that uh, Bob kindly mentioned. I came up a sort of different way. I was not a, really a trader. I was a, a buyer and seller of businesses, first as an agent, and then later as a principal in what are called private equity funds. Um, I did also set up uh, a fund that invested in hedge funds. Um, and so I've you know, been following the markets closely since, I would say, since my teens, really. And I've done a lot of international work, uh, all, virtually everywhere in the world, um, most continents, uh, save Australia, I guess. Um, and. Uh, I became very deeply concerned about the state of the global economy uh, in the 1990s, in the pale years of Bill Clinton's presidency, and um, have been skeptical about uh, whether glo globalism is a concept that makes any sense for Americans. And uh, in recent years, I've become convinced that globalism is, is, is a corrupt ideology that uh, doesn't make sense, and in fact needs to be exposed for the fraud that it is. And uh, that has led me to, to be investigating different types of frauds, whether corporate or government or in, in charity. Okay. Well, um, I, I will make the comment when we, uh, while we're uh, talking about this, that uh, globalism and sustainable development under uh, the proposals that are being made are it, are basically communism being sold to the American people into the world, and uh, my basic concern with globalism is that it totally destroys the concept of individual liberty and uh, really creates a situation financially and every other way where we are under total and complete government control from top to bottom, and uh, that's what we're going to talk about today on this program is how... Uh, that control has uh, been put in place under the Obama administration and how President Trump is being forced to try to deal with that situation and uh, what he needs to do to be able to uh, turn the ship around before we end up uh, crashing on the rocks. So uh, thank you, Charles. Thank you, Bob. Uh, Bob, would you like to start the discussion? Because I know... Uh, you tuned me into uh, a Hal Turner article uh, that uh, on the Hal Turner radio show that he wrote about the uh, uh, interbank lending is the lowest that it's been in uh, quite a long time, and uh, it, much in the same way that uh, the banks reacted in 2007-2008 that uh, caused the uh, uh, the collapse of the financial markets, and I, uh, I, I appreciate you uh, tuning me in on that article. I did uh, read it very quickly, but would you explain to our listeners uh, what that concern is all about, and then we'll, we'll kind of get into the Federal Reserve System, the International Monetary Fund, some of the other things that uh, are part of the, the whole process and, and the problem, frankly. Well, I guess you could look at the, the economy as the, the financial economy versus the real economy. And I, uh, I think that what, what you see from that article, Dan, is the fact that the, the financial economy that we rely on, they don't trust each other. The banks are not trusting the, the other banks to lend money to them, which, which means that the system is seizing up. This is a systemic failure. The, uh, the new chairman of the Federal Reserve, Mr. Powell, is obliged to, to get to the bottom of it and explain why our banks are not lending each other any money, basically because they don't trust each other. Why don't they trust each other? Because uh, of uh, 
the weapons of mass financial destruction that are out there, Mr. Warren Buffett called over-the-counter derivatives uh, a, a weapons of mass financial destruction. When Charles and I met on October 7, 2014, uh, we clicked. We clicked real well. I'm from the Chicago Board of Trade. Uh, we we are listed futures and options. Uh, I was from a bond pit, and uh, then all of a sudden, uh, over the counter, unregulated, unmargined, over the counter uh, derivatives uh, started to uh, sop up our my business. And so I was uh, from 1991 uh, very attuned to these derivatives, these weapons of mass financial destruction. And uh, we have, Charles and I came to a meeting of the minds in uh, 2014 that was about counterparty risk. When one counterparty on this $1.25 quadrillion dollar market, get wrap your heads around that, folks. When this enormous market, the biggest market in the world, has a failure, I used to deal with portfolio managers, multi-billion dollar portfolio managers. Well, they, they were governed by the legal departments. And if there's a failure, a counterparty failure, the, the entire over-the-counter derivative market has a pall over it. We have, according to Martin Armstrong, we have stress tests that are being failed in Europe right now, and uh, the over-the-counter derivative market and the counterparties is one thing. Then you've got the interbank, the canary in the mine, the interbank uh, lending that has seized up, and uh, we are we are as evidenced by the enormous volatility in this stock market and, and now the bond market, we are facing a, uh, a systemic problem that nobody's lived through before, not even in 08. And so what I would suggest to everybody who's listening is to, to walk into their bank president, wherever they've got de deposits, and say, why are the banks not lending to each other? Uh, that's called uh, moral suasion. If, if the depositors all tell the bank uh, presidents that we want an answer to this question, then it, it's up to the central bank to answer the question. Uh, but in the meantime, I think that we've gone into a long-term bear market because the Federal Reserve is shrinking their own balance sheet they're selling all the toxic garbage that they've bought up since 2008, and they're selling it into the market. And uh, the velocity in which they sell these securities to the, the unwary public is, is going to be, be exacerbate and uh, extend this, uh, this bare climate that we're in. And bear markets are, are, are much different than corrections. At 68, I've lived through bear markets. Bear markets last for years and years. Corrections last for weeks and months. So uh, get yourself some cash and make sure it's enough cash to last for a long time because we are in a secular bear market thanks to the fiscal mismanagement of our politicians who have enjoyed zero interest rates, not paying any interest on all of these $20 trillion that they have borrowed to keep themselves in office and to prop up a stock, a stock market. Uh, so those who enjoy stock profits make political contributions. Okay. I can't, hear, uh, I can't hear Charles, by the way. Well, uh, I, uh, Bob, I think that gives us a pretty good, uh, pretty good overview. Incidentally, I do want to uh, mention to our listeners that we have been living 
at virtually 0% interest rates uh, for the last uh, almost 10 years as a result of the uh, so-called restructuring of the financial markets. Uh, And the fact is, is that we are so heavily indebted as a nation and we have so much uh, paper out there floating around as a result of trying to keep the economy afloat that uh, right now, if in fact the interest rates follow what they should because of debt and all the other things, we would be in a real uh, pickle trying to pay just the interest on on the amount of money that we owe, uh, on the amount of debt that we are carrying. And these politicians have been living on borrowed time by kicking the can down the road uh, knowing full well that if the interest rates go up, it's going to have a huge impact on every citizen in this country, and it will uh, have a huge impact on the tax structure. Uh, Charles, I I, uh, I know that you know uh, Mr. Powell personally very well. Uh, you, uh, I guess, served with him at uh, Dillon Reed. You know him quite uh, uh, extensively because he's a businessman. Uh, he understands uh, econ- economies and economics. He's not uh, one of the uh, Goldman Sachs insiders, and maybe that's the reason that uh, President Trump appointed him as the Fed chair. But uh, he's got a terrific, uh, a, a better term would be horrific, uh, job in front of him trying to uh, tackle this gigantic mess that he inherited. Yes, indeed. And I haven't spoken to Jay in a number of years, but I do know him going way back into the early 80s, and I've seen him in many, mid-80s rather, I've seen him in many uh, different difficult circumstances, and he's a man of intelligence and character and compassion uh, and a good person. So I'm delighted that he is uh, uh, sitting on top of the Fed. Uh, The the Fed does have enormous academic and other, obviously, financial resources, and uh, I, I would dissect the problem slightly differently. I would say that uh, one of the reasons I'm against globalism is that the United States is by far and away the largest single unified market in the world, even now. Europe is not a unified market. Europe is in danger, I think, and it probably should fracture. Uh, so uh, the largest economy in, inside Europe is in terms of household consumption, which is really meat of any market, is... Uh, is a tiny fraction of the United States internal market. So uh, that's on the one hand. The second problem we have is that while uh, politicians and people at the top like to sell the story that there are people out there who actually save meaningful amounts of money, the sad truth in this country is that approximately 80 to 85, maybe 90 percent of this country does not save a penny a year. And it's only the very top people let's call it the top 20 percent, who in recent years have been responsible for all additions to savings in a given year. So uh, the third thing is that there's an excellent model, and the St. Louis uh, Federal Reserve Bank put something out called a capacity utilization study. Now, capacity utilization is, the idea is, you know, how much of America's total productive capacity is being used. Now, obviously, you don't use 100 percent. So you'd like to see a number that's maybe 85, 82, 85, 88 percent. Well, for for many decades, using the Fed statistics without adjusting them, the the capacity utilization rate was around 70 percent. And I'm suspicious of that figure because when listeners think about their own businesses, their own activities, it's much easier in 2018 to start a business than it was in 1968. Um, You don't necessarily need to go out and, and... get a big factory together and hire a lot of equipment and this and that, you, you can set up a business in your, in your garage or in, in your spare room or something. And the business, uh, the capital intensity of businesses today is not as high as it once was in America. So when you look, again, I'm against globalism because I think there are major imbalances in, throughout the distribution of wealth and income around the world, and it's crazy to think about one unified global market. It, it will never work that way. When you look at the total amount of, of capital expenditures inside the United States of America, it's a pittance. It's, we'll call it $2 trillion, $3 trillion maybe. And 
the stock of wealth. Bob was talking about just one set of uh, uh, instruments being in the quadrillions. So you have you know a massive amount of wealth swashing around the system. There is no regulation of it because there's no effective global regu regulator, and there never will be. Um, and so we've been in a period where rather than address the problems that should have been addressed in the run-up to the 2007-8 crash, which would have been to uh, disrupt our government, to force the discipline upon our government that each of us uh, hopefully uses in our, in our personal lives uh, to, to spend money wisely, to spend it for positive effect, to refrain from illegal activity, rather from doing any of that, we threw up our hands and said, well, we'll just let faceless bureaucrats in Washington and elsewhere um, suppress interest rates to inflate a gigantic bubble to make the wealthy even wealthier, and let these governments spend money with abandon where nobody checks anything, and then we'll defang the economists, we'll defang academia, we'll, we'll ensure that they don't tell the people the truth, and we'll pretend that there's been prosperity. And that's what we've been doing inside the United States of America ever since December 31st, 2008, arguably maybe a few months before that. And uh, now you're absolutely right. Chairman Powell does have a tool that needs to be put in place, and that is to raise interest rates in a way that doesn't bring the whole ball of wax down around the world. So that's just de dealing with the United States. As, as scary as the situation is for the United States, it's a lot worse uh, inside Europe, inside China, inside India, inside Japan, and other countries. So I'm of the school of thought that the negative effects, Bob correctly points out, were, were, were likely in a true bear market for asset values, meaning that asset values are going to come under pressure no matter wh which kind of assets you think about. Their values may well go down. Um, but relative to the rest of the world, we will, we will be a lot better off, absent some geopolitical uh, you know, strike or disaster that we don't want to think about. So uh, I, I think the, the glory days, the party's over, the champagne, we're out of champagne. If you don't drink champagne, we're out of whatever you do drink, apple juice. None of it's left. There's no cake for dessert, no ice cream. This is a time to hunker down and, in particular, focus attention on the government sector and on the academic sector, on the charity sectors, which have never been regulated the way they, the, we, the people, regulate ourselves. Right, right. Well, uh, uh, Charles, I, that that's well stated because uh, I think, you know, we've been kicking the can down the road about as far and as long as they could. And, of course, we've had discussions about the derivatives market uh, when you and Bob have been on my show before. But uh, that is really the uh, probably 50,000-pound gorilla in the room is now that uh, the fact that we've had this uh, unregulated derivatives market for a very long time, and uh, rather than correct the problem in 2008 when we, when we had the literal collapse of the world economy happening right in front of our very eyes, instead of correcting the problem that really caused a lion's share of the, of the market uh, manipulations and in, in, in the collapse they just let it get by and and they haven't done a thing with it and as Bob said we've gone from 600 trillion dollars in derivatives to over a uh, quadrillion dollars in derivatives and and they've done absolutely nothing about it and it uh, Bob would you explain to our listeners what derivatives really are and how it's just a big a big poker game, a big uh, crapshoot, really. Uh, it's, it's nothing more or less than uh, Las Vegas uh, uh, gambling. I beg to differ. Uh, there is a utilitarian reason to have derivatives. They're, they are listed futures and options that are traded on a regulated futures exchange. The, the uh, uh, OTC, over-the-counter, derivatives uh, are a product of the International Swaps Dealers Association led by J.P. Morgan and Goldman Sachs. 
and they write these uh, private treaty contracts. They stuff great big commissions in them, and, and they uh, fleece the institutional investor, uh, the, the fiduciaries who are running these funds, uh, in order to uh, engorge themselves. And so let's go. Let's go to interest rates, uh, which is the, the reflection of supply and demand for money. The interest rates are near zero, and as any other commodity, there's a cost to carry. If you have a grain elevator, that's a cost to carry the soybeans. You, know, you have to pay the elevator operator. These, uh, the cost to carry these derivatives for the past eight years has been zerp, zero interest rate policy where the International Swaps Dealers Association doesn't pay a dime to carry their books, carry these derivatives on their books. And this, this is at the expense of somebody. You know, for every debit, there's a credit. And, and it, we, we have denied the say, American Saver, the American Pension Plan uh, participant. We've been denied everybody who invests so that the international swaps dealers and the political class enjoy little to no interest on uh, on what they uh, borrow. So if you, if it doesn't cost anything to borrow any, anything, why not run up the national debt to twenty trillion dollars? And so Alan Greenspan back in the early '90s said that the, the derivatives are private treaty contracts. And that uh, it's none of your business, and uh, that they, they're designed to smooth out the beta in the economy. Now we see the beta has gone ballistic with volatility in the markets uh, that nobody has ever seen. And uh, I don't think it's ever it's going to stop because the Federal Reserve is about to dump eight years worth of, of toxic asset purchases on the public and the and the banks are smart enough to know they're not going to lend anybody any money uh, another bank any money so they can buy this garbage so bob uh, i i i hate to interrupt you uh, hold that thought we're going to mo- move into a commercial break but uh we come out of the back side of the break we'll talk more about uh, your perceptions of the derivative market The Micro Effect. www.themicroeffect.com. Well, welcome back to Connecting the Dots with Dan Happel. To get today, my guests are Bob Fanning and Charles Ortel. And uh, Bob, you were just uh, kind of explaining what uh, the derivative market uh, has done to uh, change. Our financial institutions and to uh, guarantee that we've got an enormous amount of uh, foam uh, on the on the uh, economy and what exactly that foam is going to do when uh, when this whole thing starts to implode from the enormous amount of debt we've got so go ahead and can finish uh, continue with your thought there and uh, and then I'd like to get Charles into the discussion to uh, uh, talk about what he thinks about these markets as well. Okay. Let's bifurcate and split in half the word derivative. It's, it's technically correct to call listed futures and options on exchanges like the Chicago Board of Trade and the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. Those are uh, regulated the margins are kept on a daily, if not minute-to-minute basis, and uh, we, they ha- have uh, much more integrity than the over-the-counter, unlisted derivatives market that has been promoted since Alan Greenspan was at the head of the Federal Reserve. The Federal Reserve is, uh, has the world's largest derivatives book. And so uh, who is the Federal Reserve? The Federal Reserve 
is the uh, uh, collection of the too big to fail banks who uh, go in there and do their own self-dealing at the expense of the American economy and the, Amer the American people. I'm thrilled that a regulator is such as Mr. Jay Powell is at the helm. Mr. Trump once again proved his brilliance by putting Mr. Powell at the, at the helm. Uh, so w the, these too big to fail banks uh, can't use fraud in order to engorge themselves at the public's expense. So if I were to be a, a fortune teller uh, after dealing with these institutional investors uh, from the floor of the Chicago Board of Trade, I would have to say that someday when we have a counterparty failure and uh, th that looks as, more, as we get more volatile uh, in the marketplace, we're going to get closer to the counterparty failure. As we have counterparty failures, these these portfolio managers, these investment policy committees, uh, it, they don't act with, uh, unilaterally with the supreme authority. They are uh, monitored by their legal departments. And so I can envision, first, the junior portfolio managers being fired so they have a scapegoat uh, for getting into the over-the-counter derivatives. Then the senior ma managers will uh, will be visited by the, the legal counsel at these major institutions, uh, and the, the, uh, the, the lawyers will tell the uh, senior portfolio managers to get out. Uh, and then you will have everybody, just like institutions always do, all of the elephants hold the other elephants' tails. They will pull a plug on all of these these over-the-counter derivatives, and, and the business will go, eventually go back to listed futures and options because it's the only thing that the uh, uh, legal counsel will accept. Why will they accept them? Because they're regulated, they're margins, they're fully transparent, and... Uh, we can uh, we have been able to trust listed futures and options since 1842, and uh, that's how I think you're going to see it shake out. Is the lawyers will take over once the money managers screw it up bad enough? Go ahead. Okay. Well, um, uh, Bob, uh, too. I think we we all uh, we've had this discussion a number of times, but. Uh, what really happened in uh, 2008 when the market started to, uh, to collapse and we saw all the uh, federal intervention uh, in putting money into the markets, uh, the, the reality of that, the, the reason that uh, those markets were collapsing was because uh, the derivatives uh, market was failing. And they needed to pump money into that to keep the derivatives market alive because all those bad bets on, on uh, over-leveraged uh, institutional uh, uh, mortgages. Credit, defa and, uh, credit default swaps. Credit yeah, default. yeah, credit default swaps. That's exactly right. And uh, that is the reason that we even had the meltdown in the first place, and they haven't solved the problem. They, they haven't done anything with it. Well, who, who told uh, uh, Citibank and uh, AIG uh, to write the, the, this naked premium that we call credit default swaps? Robert Rubin was the co-chair of uh, or the chair of Citibank. And he marched into Thomas G. Harris's office. And Thomas was a uh, he was at the Chicago Board of Trade, and then he went to uh, Citibank. And he told uh, Maharis to write these credit default swaps. Basically, Robert Rubin, who was the former chair, partner in charge of arbitrage, told Goldman Sachs's biggest competitor. To write this naked premium, and Goldman Sachs was able to not only 
uh, get these credit default swaps uh, written against Goldman Sachs securitizations. But when uh, when Citibank failed and the taxpayer had to bail it out, Goldman Sachs was able to eliminate a, a competitor. And so these uh, there are predators on uh, Wall Street, just like there are predators lurking in the alley. And uh, Robert Rubin's one of them. The, the other fella is uh, Hank uh, Paulson. Paulson. Yes. Henry mm-hmm. Paulson, who was a Goldman Sachs partner and chairman of the, the uh, uh, head of the Treasury, he was he was the, one of the uh, originators of these toxic security and securitizations that that uh, basically uh, destroyed our system. And so we we really need to do a a, uh, a forensic audit of this whole situation, beginning back uh, in uh, with the 16th Congress when uh, we did regulatory capture and figure out what is wrong with this system that the uh, predators are able to write the rules and regulate themselves. Mm-hmm. Uh, pop quiz of the day for your listeners. Who, uh, who chooses the chairman of the Fed? It's, it's a lottery between Goldman Sachs and, and uh, uh, J.P. Morgan, and they they install their own guy to uh, to run the Federal Reserve. So they 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 Goldman Sachs and and J P Morgan own the printing press to bail themselves out, and they also have enough sway over the the uh, Congress where they can do anything they want with our financial system and be just as predatory as they they feel like because they, they have all of the, the keys to the kingdom. Go ahead, Dan. Mm-hmm. Well, and uh, Bob, you know, of course, we know that the system, uh, so-called Federal Reserve, is neither federal and there are no reserves. The fact is, is that it's a private banking cartel uh, of institutional banks who pretty much own our economy. And when Congress turned that... Uh, right to regulate our our economy and our money over to uh, this group called the Federal Reserve in 1913. Uh, it was supposedly to make the markets better and smoother, and to end all the uh, financial, uh, let's say, manipulations that uh, had had happened to the markets before then. And in fact, since then, it's been uh, ten times worse. So, uh, Charles, I want to get you into this discussion because you are a forensic auditor of uh, uh, some notoriety because you've been auditing the Clinton Foundation. And so you know how this whole system works. And Bob had said something about we need a forensic audit of the Fed. Tell me what you think about that. All right. Well, just to to, correct, I I am doing... uh, Analysis, uh, financial analysis of charities and of companies, but I am not technically an auditor. Just to be clear, I have an MBA and that's it. But I have a lot. I've employed auditors all over the world. I'm familiar with how they work. Uh, I just want to set the record straight on that. I, I think what we need, uh, first of all, is we need uh, to bring into better balance uh, how large pieces of our economy are cross-checked. Uh, I got into this work exposing what I saw as potential fraud at General Electric Company. I did that in 2007 and 8. I was very concerned about, uh, you know, uh, other highly leveraged uh, uh, corporations, specifically the banks, AIG itself. And when you get into the weeds, you discover that the entity that's supposed to give us the com- the entities that are supposed to give us comfort are not really up to the job. I mean, the, the rating agencies, the debt rating agencies, we're giving the, their highest possible ratings, what are called AAA ratings, to General Electric debt, which didn't deserve 
the highest possible ratings, but to General Electric Capital Debt, which certainly didn't deserve it, and to many other banks, which ultimately, in short order, either went out of existence because they were bought, uh, you know, in fire sale ways, or in the case of Bear Stearns, for uh, pittance, uh, Lehman. Um, the entire regulator, regulatory system of, of debt ratings didn't work. The SEC didn't see this in advance. So far, there hasn't been any, there haven't been any significant penalties in my mind, which would include jail right, and large amounts of financial restitution. There have been no such penalties, not only against the executives who promoted some of these crazy schemes, but against the boards of directors that missed didn't discharge their responsibilities. They were too happy collecting. They all say that, oh, it's not really the money that we're doing this for well, when they're collecting, in some cases, $500,000 or more for part-time work uh, on multiple different boards on top of their other responsibilities. And, and nobody's really gone after the accounting firms. There are only four big ones left um, and of consequence. And uh, so we don't really have, we're not getting good data. We don't have uh, reg, uh, raiders that we can trust, raiders of debt instruments. We, the stock analysts, you know, they're not really motivated to do anything. Uh, we, we don't force companies, <coughs> excuse me, to make reports the way I think ordinary people would care about them, to know how much profit is earned inside cash flow and revenue inside this country and how much abroad, how much do the employees make by class of employee. We don't get key information uh, to judge uh, whether these companies are contributing positively or negatively to the American economy uh, and to the wider world. And there needs to be really a soup-to-nuts restructuring of, of you know, the information investors get, public gets, how this is regulated, and, as Bob suggests, you know, a, a deep dive into the, what happened, what actually truly happened, not the fiction, what really happened to the American economy, and how do we position our great economy and our great country to to have a century or more of prosperity as opposed to living in a casino. That's a good way to put it. Um, I, I think, you know, the fact that uh, in our country we've, we've seen these things happen now several times uh, in a fairly short period of time. 2008 was a perfect example where they had an opportunity to clean up the system and not only to kick the can down the road to uh, get by with what had been a real mistake, but to actually clean up the system and make it better, put, uh, put uh, Glass-Steagall back into effect, uh, do some things that would really improve the economy, and they failed to do that. Uh, Bob, uh, what do you... And I, I, you understand this system very well. I mean, I, I know from conversations with you, you understand financial markets better than just about anybody I know. Uh, will, you, uh, will you say that you think that there's a chance that we can actually uh, get our elected and our political leaders to do the right thing, which would involve uh, really some belt tightening some changes in the whole structure. Well, the markets have a, a, a way of doing some price discovery. We're right in the middle of that price discovery as the, the uh, Federal Reserve sells these uh, toxic securities that they've bought for the past eight years. The speed in which they spell, uh, sell, the velocity in which they sell these securities is going to exacerbate the volatility, which heightens the risk of a, a counterparty failure. I believe that time is of the essence. And if we're gonna sell these toxic securities into the marketplace, in, into the 6,700 community banks, into our pension funds, into the hands of the investing public, I believe that it, what's important is that th we reverse engineer this entire portfolio and get the garbage out it, it, so the unwilling uh, people or un unsophisticated people are not uh, buying them up. That, that these securities will be uh, offered to the public with enormous commissions in them to, to bring out the greed in the brokerage 
industry. So f before you, you hand the, this toxic garbage over to, uh, the, to the dealers to sell, reverse engineer them and get all the really bad garbage out of it. Don't create new tranches. Have a debt jubilee on all of that uh, 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 stuff that is unsaleable. And uh, I, I believe that we also should reverse engineer the Federal Reserve's entire derivatives book. Uh, my pet project is the water and electricity up in the northwest corner of Montana. I'm in federal uh, court uh, with an active lawsuit over it. And the judges told us to quantify the harm. I believe what will be discovered is that the electricity from Montana's uh, hydroelectric dams has been transferred by derivatives into the coffers of the Federal Reserve, which is the alter ego for the too big to fail banks. I, I believe you're going to find a lot of corruption, but I believe America, in its own self defense, had better reverse engineer these toxic securities and these toxic derivatives. And they owe Mr. Trump an enormous apology because they were appalled when he said that uh, the system is rigged. Mr. Trump had nailed it. The system is rigged, and the, the be best way to unrig it is to take control of the Federal Reserve and the too big to fail banks who have used America as if they were sheep to be seared and lamb chops to be served up on, on occasion. Yeah, well, and uh, Bob, I think we recognize the, the fact that the Federal Reserve System was, very, from its very inception, uh, designed to uh, allow too big to fail banks, and they weren't too big to fail at the time that it was organized, but they certainly are now, uh, uh, supposedly. Uh, but the, the whole system was designed to fleece the American public because every dollar that goes into existence is borrowed. Every dollar is based on debt and not on assets, and that's the difference between a commodity based financial system and a fiat financial system like the Federal Reserve. And I think our listeners understand that. I, uh, uh, I have a very good friend by the name of G. Edward Griffin who happens to have written a, a hallmark book on that called The Creature from Jekyll Island. And it explains just exactly how predatory the system is. Um, Bob, I have this question, though. I have to ask you, uh, considering the size of the unregulated uh, derivatives market, uh, is there any way that we can uh, reel that in without destroying the financial system? Well, 300,000 people in the financial services industry lost their jobs in 2000 with the 2008 collapse. If we can afford to hire uh, people for the, the non-essential government employees, why can't we hire these people to be uh, forensic auditors of these toxic securities uh, and, uh, and, and see what is really the poison? and what really should be sold into the system. Selling securities by the Federal Reserve will in fact naturally drive up interest rates. If the quality of these securities is junk, then it's gonna be a much higher interest rate that is demanded by the investor. So why not uh, uh, have these uh, and toxic securities uh, completely reverse engineered so you can get a higher quality rating than junk before it's handed over to the public. And let's see what the Federal Reserve has been up to with their derivatives book. Were these genuine one-to-one -one hedges? Were they speculating? Or were they looting? as in the case of Montana's electricity. Were they looting uh, 
innocent Montanans and their private property in order to engorge the two big to fail banks that the Federal Reserve is acting as a straw man for. That's pretty much what I would do. You know, let's okay. create jobs for the financial service professionals that are capable of auditing these securities. Maybe even jobs for senior citizens. Well, they certainly have their job cut out for them. There'd be a lot of job security in uh, trying to uh, determine the, the depth and the size of the uh, derivatives market uh, with, with <laughs> the amount of money that's out there floating in the uh, in the ether. Um, Charles, people like Charles, we're going to have people like Charles Ortel could supervise them. Well, that's exactly what I was going to suggest because uh, Charles has done uh, a lot of work uh, in uh, really uh, opening up the information on the Clinton Foundation, and he's exposed an enormous amount of fraud uh, within the Clinton Foundation. And I can't think of anybody that would be better to be in charge of an audit of the Fed uh, than Charles Ortel. So, uh, Charles, you've been working with uh, the, the forensic audit people, and I understand you're not an auditor, but you're certainly probably, in, in reality, you're one of these guys that, uh, even though you don't have uh, maybe the credential, you've got a lot more knowledge about it than 90% of the people that actually do it. Uh, tell us what you think about the expose of the uh, financial markets, what you see as being the biggest problems, and then maybe what you think some of the solutions might be. Well, so I think um, there's, there's really, there are many pieces to the puzzle, but just to pick two uh, to keep the conversation manageable, interest rates and incomes. So um, the value, ultimately the value of any asset is going to depend, is going to be a function of those two things, in my opinion. You know, what are the benchmark interest rates? Uh, for that, I mean the, ten, the interest rate on 10-year U.S. government debt if you're an American. And what is the total stock of income, pre-tax income, and then after-tax income that people earn inside the United States of America? We need to be looking at those trends. So what happened is, that in the period 1982 to 1999, uh, interest rates went down and incomes went soaring up. And you can see those statistics. The Federal Reserve publishes historical interest rate statistics, I believe, on the 10-year going back to 1965, might be 1964. And the national income and product accounts of the, that are put out by the Bureau of Economic Analysis inside the Commerce Department, uh, they have great data on income for the United States going back to 1929, many cut many different ways. So we saw uh, an unusual period. When interest rates go down, asset values are going to go up. When incomes go up, asset values may go up. So um, those were conditions that were fantastic conditions. Now, who's responsible for those conditions? Was it political action? I doubt it. Was it d demography? That's why I think really contributed a lot to that. It happened in that time frame, 1982 to 1999. Really the person's age. Sorry? Hello? Yeah, go ahead, Charles. I'm not sure what that uh, what that sound was in the background, but go ahead and continue your thought. Yeah. So, so if persons age 25 to 54 who tend to, to spend the most amount of money, that's when you're forming a household, that's when you're buying homes, that's when you're filling them up with kids and furniture and other things. There, there was a ro robust, I would argue, demographic-based um, uh, uh, tailwind helped in this period create a monumental first bubble that blew up in, by May of 2000. Okay? Then in the period from... May 2000 or 2000, right away to 2007, a different set of conditions started to operate. We went from an economy that happened well before that, where business was centered inside the United States, to one in which we outsourced a large amount of the production 
and brought it back. Charles, to uh, I, I hate to interrupt you, but uh, we're going to into a commercial break. Let's uh, pick that thought up on the other side of the break. Sure. You take the blue pill. The story ends. You wake up in your bed and believe whatever you want to believe. You take the red pill. You stay in Wonderland. And I show you how deep the rabbit hole goes. There was a mighty nation, blessed above all of creation. It was a rare and precious pearl. Conceived in faith and liberty, home of the brave, land of the free. The envy of the world But this shining city on a hill Has turned from the creator's will And let evil take control Now the reckless men who lead them Want to strip away their freedom And to steal their very soul Now it's smoke and mirrors Switching baits Criticize and confiscate and let the guilty walk away. In this once righteous, godly nation, in the halls of education, they forbid a child to pray. They say we need to spread the wealth. They pretend to guard the health of the feeble and the poor. While the hand they hold behind their back confuses and conceals back that the wolf is at the door. There's an unseen hand that pulls the string. It makes his little puppets dance to every song he sings. It's a night old on a rising tide. Welcome back to Connecting the Dots with Terry Young Apple. And uh, today my guests are Bob Fanning and Charles Ortel. And sorry, Charles, I had to uh, interrupt for the commercial break, but uh, uh, go ahead and continue with the thoughts that you had as we were uh, going into that break. Sure. So, so what happened in the period from 2000 to, say, uh, <clears throat> December 31st, 2008, is that um, the, the, uh, the, the g demographic factors that were pushing incomes up started not to have the same effect. Global competition started to get much tough, tougher. India and China started rising. People started outsourcing. In so incomes in the United States didn't grow uh, at, at the same growth rate in an aggregate as they had from 82 to 99, which was an historically unusual pit long bull market with a little blip in 1990, but mo mostly a, a bull market. Um, and instead of being about the business of attracting uh, jobs to the United States, about figuring out how to produce products and services inside the United States and sell them inside the United States and around the world, we entered a period, this is a, this is a simple summary, of where we were outsourcing, where we, we got into financial engineering, we uh, allowed the, the banks, which had been given liberties under the Clinton administration, and then under the Bush administration, we allowed them to just, you know, change the whole basis upon which the American economy was run. And there was no accountability. It used to be, uh, in the old days, if you were a banker and your bank lost money, um, you know, our bank had a reversal in profits, nobody got a bonus. Uh, but in this new world, of the casino world, nobody seems to get hurt in a, in a, in a bad period. No, there's no accountability. And in a good period, you get the compensation consultants in to say, well, you know, Jeff Immelt, you know, you, there's only one Jeff, Jeff Immelt, and people, there's no other firm like GE, and everyone else is making $20 million, so he ought to make 25 You know, even though the stock of GE went, another company I studied closely, from 2001, when he took over on September 7th, the stock price was about 40 bucks, and now it's about 14 You know, and, dude, and it didn't split. <laughs> You know, so uh, nonetheless, a guy like Jeff Immel, he makes walks away with a couple hundred million or more, uh, having run that company into the ground. So we're in this period uh, leading up to the crash 
where things weren't working, we weren't learning from our mistakes, then the crash happened, and then rather than tr really try to fix it, we threw up our hands, uh, abandoned, you know, uh, our, an interest in really looking at the chief culprits who may well have been Goldman Sachs and Morgan and the other, other ones, as well as the Federal Reserve. We didn't want to do that. We turned over the keys to the global economy to these very same actors. And, you know, we had a, a historic president. Uh, some felt that, you know, he, 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 need, he needed to look like a genius. So there was no real interest in, in understanding what led to the election and crash of 2008, how to fix it. Instead, we entered this, uh, what I call financial purgatory, neither in heaven or in hell. We were just in a fantasy land waiting to know our fate. And well, now the time has come to learn our fate because Mr. Chairman Powell has to raise interest rates. You see, mm -hmm. uh, at least I see in my daily life, signs of inflation, uh, meaningful inflation, certainly in, in the most important mm -hmm. product uh, in, in, a, in a family's uh, uh, cost portfolio is, is higher education. And the cost of higher education has been rising far faster than consumer price inflation for a long, long time. So we, we've done this now for 10 years. Uh, there's not much room left. Uh, we, we're going to have to raise interest rates. But in the, in the pain that's coming, I think the American people, whether they're the Bernie Sanders supporters who see things through one prism and don't like what they see, or the Donald Trump supporters who saw uh, America and the wider world through a different set of, uh, a different prism. Uh, we all understand across the political spectrum that something is deeply rotten in the swamps, not just in D.C., but in our state capitals. And it is time to, you know, we're, all, we're mostly grown-ups. We're an aging population, average age, I think, 37.8 years or so. I mean, we're grown-ups. We, we can understand if there's corruption, let's expose it, let's punish the people. But we do have lots of good things relative to the rest of the world, and we can do, we will be hurt less in this bear market than many other countries. And eventually, you know, we'll come back into balance and start growing again. But we, we really need to have a thoughtful uh, discussion, wide-ranging discussion, understand what happens so, uh, so that we can understand what to do in the future. No, I think, um, uh, Charles, that's probably one of the best explanations I've heard of how the uh, the markets changed uh, between 1980 and where we're at today. And, you know, the bottom line on a lot of that, there's two, two main factors there, is politicians want to continue to get reelected, and so they don't want to face the day of reckoning. So they kick the can down the road. And meanwhile, our entire financial system was being changed. It was being morphed into a global financial system, and our our uh, elected officials were uh, allowing a change in the whole structure of the system that would send uh, much of our manufacturing, much of our industrial base, and many of the jobs that... Uh, paid for the greatness of this country overseas because one thing we've got to understand about the globalists is that they believe that the United States, not that we're exceptional in the traditional sense, but that we are the one that needs to be uh, give up all of what we are good at and give it to other countries around the world and and meanwhile, we end up with nothing except we're the guys paying for all this. Is that kind of the way you see it, too? Well, on, on globalism, what I uh, what I don't like, and, I, and I've seen this through my my, my corporate uh, projects, when you start looking at almost any large business, um, twenty percent of the clients account for eighty percent of the activity, typically. Similarly, when you think about economic activity, 20% of uh, the nations, or let's call them 200, there are 193 in the UN, let's round it up to 200 because there are some ones for various reasons, this makes it simpler. 40 nations on Earth do account for more than 80% of the total amount of goods and services that are consumed on the planet. And you get that data from UNCTAB, which is a division of the UN, has an excellent database that shows that to soup to nuts, all the work is done for you. And 
you know, so if 40 nations account for, for eight, actually more than 80, but let's call it 80 percent, you know, why do we need to set up some organization that, that is going to, you know, deal with another 160 nations, many of whom are very small and scattered all over the place? I mean, well, why would we ever go down that? Instead, what you would try to do is if you're trying to fix something, and this is sort of philosophically, you start with yourself, make sure you're in good shape, then you work on your family, then you work on your neighbors and your community and your city and your state. And, but, you know, the last thing you want to do is start first with some gigantic bureaucracy of 200 nations that, you know, got so far away from the United States of America in terms of the historical uh, uh, precedents, the culture, the infrastructure. I mean, it's, just, it's, a, it's a ludicrous idea save for uh, national leaders who need to think about what they're going to do next. And, you know, maybe they can't get reelected because they serve two terms. So what, what better thing to do than create an even bigger mess than the one you've created in your own home country? No. I think globalism, and in particular unregulated globalism, is a fool's errand. And it, 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 it sells well in the, uh, in the academic uh, faculty lounges because, in, you know, Harvard, for example, I went to Harvard uh, Business School. I mean, with globalism, you go from an American pool of applicants to a global pool of applicants, many of whom are rich and some not necessarily getting rich the honest way. And if you don't change the number of places, you suddenly have changed the whole bargaining power of Harvard University versus the world. You have a floodgate of applications. You take around the same number of people. Suddenly your endowment goes up. Your professors make more. And, you know, of course, for the academic world, globalism is fantastic. The professors get to travel more and make more, and, you know, they get involved with investment funds and all that. Politicians, globalism is fun. You get to fly around the world and do all that stuff. You've got job security outside the country if you don't have it inside the country. Charity land is fun. But the only person, the main people hurt by unregulated globalism are we the people. Um, yeah. and, so, no, I don't think we should be rushing down that course until we get our own house in order first. I don't think we can be the responsible global partners that we need to be until we are absolutely sure that we've gotten exposed to corruption that is obvious and manifest inside Washington, D.C., with the Clinton Foundation revelations and now the, 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 the likelihood that President Obama's team spied on uh, political opponents of Hillary Clinton and of, of President Obama. I mean, we've got some rot that we've got to expose, get fully uh, dealt with inside this country. People need to go to prison. And we've got some house cleaning to do here. We've got to get our own house in order. And once our own house in order is in order here, we better start thinking about the large uh, organizations like the UN and the World Health Organization and others that are corrupt as hell. And we got to stop. You know, we don't need to send money into these corrupt organizations. We've got, we need money here to fix our own house. So, no, I'm very yeah. much against unregulated globalism. I think it's, in some ways, it's far worse than communism. Well, the thing is, is they are tied. Uh, ultimately, they're tied together because many of the, uh, the people that uh, envision uh, a fully functional globalist system uh, are people that believe in in uh, unregulated socialism and well overregulated socialism and communism because they see sharing the wealth as being the secret to uh, uh, you know a successful world and in fact uh, creating a, a world where we have a, a financial system that is based on sound. Uh, economic principles and capitalism has got a much better chance of succeeding. Is that for Bob? Yeah, Bob, uh, would you like to, uh, to tell our listeners what you think about this, uh, this, uh, uh, this globalism, the way things are going, and, uh, and then maybe we can move into uh, some of the conversations about uh, what's been uh, exposed in Washington, D.C. recently as far as the Pfizer report and some of the other things. Yeah, I'd love to, Dan. Uh, we have a mutual friend. His name is Larry Kogan, and uh, he explains to me and everybody else who will listen 
that the the EU, the uh, the European Union, the socialists of the world, uh, are trying to impose through our legal system the the European terms, standards, and conditions on our system. So we have we have to uh, pay close attention to the fact that the Europeans do not impose their terms, standards, and conditions through the use of regulatory lawfare aimed against capitalism. What I would recommend on a long-term vision for the American people is that rather than nice haircuts, pretty smiles, or which victim group, self-identified victims group, that, that, that they are currying favor with, let's, let's set a standard for this next election of 2018. America is no longer in the business of wealth redistribution. We are in the business of wealth creation. We used to grow at 8%. Now if we're growing at 3%, that, that's acceptable. It's totally unacceptable. It's especially unacceptable after eight years of zero interest rates. Our pension funds are are in danger of collapse. Our uh, uh, savers have been denied a return on their investment for eight years. This is America's uh, baby boomers who have been intentionally... uh, looted. I use the term looted specifically uh, of the return on their investment capital. So we have an obligation as a society to turn to anybody who's running for public office in the the next election, regardless of political affiliation, to have as their top priority to, to grow this economy at 8% in order to generate the internally generated capital necessary from growing the economy in order to service these uh, retirement plans. We can't have our senior citizens uh, camping out uh, in the wintertime because the Federal Reserve and the two big to fail banks decided to use these policies to enrich themselves at society's expense. And the, the, the reason I voted for Mr. Trump, he is a businessman, he understands return on capital, and uh, uh, he said that the system is rigged and that he wants to repatriate $1.77 trillion that was stolen from America's worker and bring it back into the system in order to to service this twenty trillion dollars worth of debt, and and so let's let's make it uh, the number one priority of the swing election of eighteen that regardless of who's running for office, that they put at the top of their agenda wealth creation and eliminate this wealth distribution baloney and, and grow this economy at 8%, that's our target, 8%, so we can make up for the ground that has been lost over the last eight years of zero interest rate policy and and, uh, the lack of capital. And now the banks have the gall and audacity to stop lending to each other uh, when America needs it the most. Mm-hmm. So let's instruct these banks to lend to the entrepreneur, the small business who creates or used to create 65% of America's jobs, and, and let's let's get the entrepreneur out there paying taxes, so we can keep this economy afloat and growing at an 8% rate. 3%, 2% is totally unacceptable. Mm-hmm. Well, and, and Bob, one of the things that uh, has come up uh, numerous times in uh, different uh, political and uh, 
regulatory uh, conversations is the fact that during the last 20 years, we have added so many new regulations to our legal system in this country. And, and in truth, and I've, I've been told they're not really laws or regulations, and there is a difference. But the reality is we've made it impossible for small business to function in this country in the way that uh, we could 20, 30, 40 years ago. And we need to eliminate a lot of those regulations to uh, uh, put, put the juice back in small business and uh, back into free enterprise in this country. You, you've mentioned that a number of times. I know you feel that way yourself. Tell us, our listeners, uh, why it's so important to get rid of all these regulations. When I uh, started this litigation in Montana that stopped, that tried to throw the, uh, the brakes on uh, the Salish Kootenai Water Compact, the way I raised legal funds, legal fees, was by creating a company in Missoula, Montana called Regulatory Lawfare Relief. We need relief from the lawfare that is being conducted against the American people with European-style regulations, and we need to slash the bureaucrats. If the government is shut down right now, and we have the essential employees and the non-essential employees that are identified, what's wrong with firing the non-essential people. Any any company in, in in the world would eliminate the non their non-essential employees. Let's trim government. Let's go, let's get rid of these people who create regulations to enslave the American public in order to enrich them and gorge themselves, enrich themselves. And uh, a prime example of regulation that brought down America was the Community Reinvestment Act. They passed regulation that g gave people who were unworthy of mortgages a, uh, a chance to, to borrow, including the down payment, without uh, being worthy of the, uh, the loan. So these regulators who, who pretend to be do-gooders are, are, all they're doing is growing their bureaucracy so they can uh, enrich themselves. My pet project was the Wolf Reintroduction Project, uh, where bureaucrats, uh, zealots, force wolf, re wolf introduction on Montana, created enormous bureaucracies, and once they did it, they were rewarded with six-figure, multiple six-figure jobs with non-governmental organizations that are the pet projects of the likes of George Soros. So uh, let's, get, let's remove those incentives. Let's roll back the regulations. For every regulation that is passed, we're obliged to uh, nullify a new, an old one. Mr. Trump did it right at the Environmental Protection Agency, and so did Mr. Zinke, when they started firing people. If they're non-essential, get rid of them. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, and the, the, so many of these uh, non-governmental organizations and uh, big uh, foundations, tax-exempt foundations, have such an enormous amount of influence on uh, various uh, government agencies, including Congress, because uh, they have the ability to lobby. They have the ability to uh, spend the trillions of dollars that they've collected for these uh, uh, so-called causes. And in, in the process, they end up with undue influence uh, throughout the, uh, the whole political culture. And they abuse 501c3 of the tax code, that they, they, the 501c3 says that they can't use uh, the money for a political action, 
and uh, we we have to do uh, 501c3 audits and uh, use the IRS not to, uh, to crush Tea Party opposition, but instead to crush the, the bureaucracy that we have fondly named the deep state. Mm -hmm. Yep. That's what well, the deep state I is. And, and I know that, Charles, uh, obviously, you, you're uh, very familiar with this because you've done the audits uh, on the uh, Clinton Foundation. And, you know, so many of these big foundations, even though they have these uh, uh, really, uh, you know, wonderful mandates that they're supposedly doing, in fact, uh, very little of this work gets done. Uh, that they initially raised the funds for, and in fact, it usually ends up just being an enhancement of the of the family coffers. Uh, that's certainly the the case of the Clinton Foundation. Uh, tell us a little bit about uh, some of the things that the Clinton Foundation has done, all oh, like the Haiti uh, fundraising and some things like that, because that has an enormous amount of uh, political clout with it. And at the same time, uh, all it does is enhance uh, individuals. Sure. So just a, a quick overview comment. I think there are about $5 trillion locked inside uh, American tax-exempt organizations. That's a lot of money. Now, many of the people who operate these charities, many of them are smaller, but many of the people who work, most of the people who work inside these charities are decent human beings. They may have different political views, but they, they take the rules very seriously. What is egregious about the Clintons and the Clinton Foundation, and I, I fear as well now perhaps the Obama Foundation is off to the wrong start as well, what is egregious about the Clintons is they have no excuse whatsoever uh, to say that you know, they weren't smart enough to understand the rules, they, you know, they were unsophisticated. You know, these are people who went to the best institutions. Bill likes to call himself a Rhodes Scholar. I call him a rogue, R-O-G-U-E, a rogue scholar. Uh, and, you know, Hillary is touted as being one of the smartest lawyers ever, one of the best candidates for president ever. This is a thing that started out as a fraud the day it was formed on October 23, 1997, which was a very bad moment for the Clintons in that period. In that period, uh, months before the lawsuit against uh, the, the, the legal um, stalling tactics employed at U.S. government expense, uh, in part, uh, to delay Paula Jones' lawsuit. Um, the, that the order was given, no, you can't delay. I think it was a Supreme Court decision. So they found out that, that the expensive lawsuit and the embarrassing lawsuit that, that Paula Jones was going to bring was going to proceed while Bill was president. And they also found out at the same moment in time that the person who had been charged with raising a, a, a legal expense trust uh, had, had a role in it, Charlie Tree, uh, had been raising money illegally from foreign contributors. And so the first legal expense trust uh, had to be wound up by December 31st, 1997. So this was a period in time where they needed money, their bills were climbing, they knew they had this embarrassment coming. They did, may not have known that they would have been facing impeachment by 1998. But they were in a world of hurt. So what better vehicle to have than a foundation uh, run at a time where Bill people were supervising the IRS, justice, et cetera. What, what better thing to have than an unregulated, in effect, slush fund? This is The Micro Effect. The Micro Effect. www.themicroeffect.com. Welcome back to the uh, last half hour of the uh, Connecting the Dot Show with Dan Happel. And uh, uh, Charles Ortel and Bob Fanning are my guests today. Charles, you were talking about the Clinton Foundation uh, when we went into break. I'd love to give you the opportunity to finish up uh, on that discussion. 
And then, uh, Bob, I want to lead into the last half hour with whether or not the uh, problems that we see in the financial markets are actually uh, contrived, whether they're being done intentionally or if this is uh, uh, just bad judgment on the part of uh, a number of these groups. So, uh, Charles, go ahead and finish your thoughts on the Clinton Foundation, and then we'll get into that other discussion. Sure. Well, I'll be quick. Um, so the, the Clinton Foundation uh, is a public charity uh, it, that has actually been controlled by the Clinton family illegally since November 2nd, 2013. Um, it is operating in every U.S. state. It is operating around the world in many countries. It has not filled its paperwork out properly. It is required to do so. It is as we speak on this broadcast, trying to raise money illegally. And unfortunately for the Clintons, many, the, the uh, IRS is now finally, has been finally investigating this. Excuse me, um, the Justice Department has people investigating it. Um, I believe that states, U.S. states are starting to investigate. And around the world, foreign governments are starting to investigate. So this long pattern and practice of deception, obstruction of justice, corruption, money laundering, wire fraud, bank fraud, tax fraud, etc., is just plain as the nose on your face. And the real questions for these investigators include not only the, the, the scope uh, and uh, complexity of the fraud, but why the IRS and why the Department of Justice under Republican and Democratic presidents alike, going all the way back to 1997, why did the IRS allow this fraud to start? Why did the IRS uh, why did people, why did James Comey and Bob Mueller from 2001 to 2005, why were they involved with an investigation into Clinton Foundation fraud that found nothing, even though the fraud was obvious? Why did it escalate from 2005 afterwards? Why did the Democratic elite, including President Obama, allow Hillary Clinton to run for president, given the unresolved nature of this vast fraud? You know, we're, I think this Clinton Foundation investigation ties into the investigation of mishandling of classified information. Why did Barack Obama allow Hillary Clinton to operate uh, the State Department using secret services, ser servers and unsecured devices? Why did, she, uh, why did President Obama, the Obama administration, and others allow her to keep all of this information in her personal control in the mansions in D.C. and Chappaqua and only return it? many months, more than a year after she had left the Secretary of State. Why did that happen? Why did they attempt to bury the fact that, indeed, by February 2016, this is in the public domain, that uh, the FBI had determined that she had 2,115 emails with classified information on them out of the 30,490 that she turned in, or people turned in in December 5th, 2000, I think it was 14, 15? Again, I forget exact, the exact date on the turn-in. But anyway, why did they why did they take so long to reach this determination, uh, and why was Hillary allowed to run? These are all major league questions. This is what happens when you start with a small fraud, and fraudsters get away with a small fraud, and then they realize that you know the fraud gets bigger and bigger. It's a lot of fun to use the foundation. I'm saying quotes as a as an incoming vehicle for for dirty money. Uh, and it's a lot of fun to divert money from the foundation. You don't get caught. You don't get taxed on the money. You just use the money however you want. This is this is a massive fraud. I've called it the largest unprosecuted fraud, not in American history, but in world history, considering all its affiliates. And I'm hopeful that it's finally, I'll be three years into this in March of this year, I'm hoping that before long we'll start to see justice come. Well, and I, I agree with that, and, and the thing is is that uh, we're, we're seeing how the Clinton Foundation and their money and Obama were going after the uh, Trump uh, candidacy and, and trying to destroy his ability to get uh, elected to president, uh, and, and that it was done in a way that was uh, really uh, very, very... Uh, I don't know, very illegal. That's just the only way to put it. Very illegal and uh, very unethical. And somehow that all got buried. Everything got buried. And 
Uh, Comey and Mueller were part of that, and uh, I just hope that uh, the American people are paying attention and that we start to get pop the lid off this uh, uh, this little mess, this little tinder box that's in there, and uh, hopefully we can discover just exactly what did happen. Uh, Bob, I, I started the uh, last half hour program with the discussion of whether or not all these things are intentional to destroy our financial system. Um, and, you know, this discussion that uh, Charles just had about the Clinton Foundation, there, it's obvious that there are a number of people at the very highest part of our government that would be uh, very, very happy to see the, the uh, some financial uh, mess, some financial collapse as a way of just uh, uh, destroying, I guess, any further investigation into uh, what they've done illegally. And that's something that I think all of our listeners are concerned about. Uh, what do you see with this system, Bob? Of, uh, how do you see this as being done intentionally to destroy our financial system and maybe take some of the pressure off Obama and the Clintons? I think that we can revert back to the way this country was founded as a republic. And uh, I, I disagree with Chairman Reese Greenspan about the Fed's autonomy. And uh, I believe that federal open market committee po uh, policy and actions it should be under scrutiny by the uh, Congress, the Senate, and the, the House in open hearings. Uh, I will go back to my father, who taught me well, and he taught me that the secret to retail is the velocity of inventory terms per year. So if we want our coast-to-coast, -coast, border to border retail store known as America to thrive, they're going to need cash. And uh, that cash will be sucked out of the system by the Federal Reserve liquidating these toxic securities from their portfolio. It took them eight years to do this thing we call quantitative easing by b buying up all of these toxic securities from places like Fannie Mae or the, the, the too big to fail banks. Uh, we have a very good, a superb new chairman of the Federal Reserve. He is surrounded by representatives from the too big to fails. If there was one bit of advice that I would give to America to, to make sure that, it's, that it is not turned into a wholesale uh, repudiation of Trump, if Trump will be the scapegoat, is to, to use the word velocity. And if, if adults are in charge at the Federal Reserve Open Market Committee, they will use a slow velocity to liquidate this portfolio of securities so that money isn't evaporating from the system, as evident by the current cessation of banks lending to each other. The banks are, are uh, correctly expecting a... Uh, a real bad situation with the liquida liquidation of this portfolio. It's the business of 320 million Americans to make sure that the, the uh, Federal Reserve Board is not a bunch of demagogues using monetary policy and the liquidation of these securities in order, in order to discredit Mr. Trump. So the velocity in which they liquidate these securities is important. The, the fact of the matter is that all Americans, all 320 million of us, ought to reflect our genuine concern of the banks freezing up. Take the, take the issue off the table 
for 6,700 community banks that are uh, uh, afraid of uh, the liquidation of these securities. I also believe that there should be repealed a law known as the Jamie Dimon Bankster Bail-In Bill from 2014. The International Swatch Dealers Association got a, a bill passed in the, the uh, fourth quarter of 2014 that said the depositors of all 6,700 community banks, if there is a derivative failure, if the counterparties failed, that the, uh, all all accounts and all 6,700 of these community banks are fair game to pay off these derivatives. Let's repeal that bill and, and uh, let you know let these private treaty contracts uh, not be the uh, the burden of the taxpayer who got hosed in 2008 at the FDIC nor the saver who's been, he's been hosed uh, since, uh, since the collapse of 2008 with the zero interest rate policies. And I believe that adults are, are in charge, at least with Mr. Powell, and I believe that the American public uh, should demand accountability and responsibility in the liquidation of this port portfolio, and if it took them eight years to to uh, to buy up all of these securities, it should it should take them eight years to liquidate the the, the, the same portfolio. Mm -hmm. So the velocity is the co the problem. Mm -hmm. And and apparently, from what I've read, they've increased the uh, the sale of these derivatives. Uh, you know, out of their portfolio, that they've doubled the uh, the amount that they're trying to liquidate uh, over a, sh a short period. So this is uh, getting to be a real problem. Uh, Charles, I, w I want to ask you, what do you think about uh, reinstating Glass Steagall? I mean, that was uh, the reason that was done in the nineteen early nineteen thirties was to, uh, the, the Glass-Steagall Act, I should say, was to make sure that uh, banks separated between commercial and uh, regular uh, commercial banks and investment banks so that, in fact, when uh, a commercial bank uh, had depositors' uh, funds on, on, uh, on record or on account, uh, they couldn't turn around and use those funds for risky investments like derivatives, like uh, credit default swaps, things like that. And, in fact, that was repealed uh, in 1999, uh, and now the insurance companies, the big banks, I mean, they're all just in bed together, and they can all buy virtually anything they want uh, with 0% interest funds, and now we're at a point where it's, it's time, I think, to separate those commercial banks and investment banking functions again. And uh, that would really curtail some of that uh, derivatives market. Uh, uh, Charles, tell us what you think about that. Well, I think, you know, we've, we've gone from a relatively risk-averse uh, history um, and I'm going way back into history, many decades, to being a risk-embracing country, uh, in particular in this financial purgatory period, December 31, 2008 forward. So I think we need uh, we need a, a totally different system of uh, information sharing and then uh, risk and reward sharing. And at present, what we have, uh, you know, the interest rates would not be zero percent right now if uh, bankers understood that in a crash, they might be personally liable uh, for, for gigantic losses, uh, which was the case, you know, before the creation of the Federal Reserve. My, one of my ancestors was involved with a bank in Montana, uh, and, you know, if you wanted to be a director of a bank or to be a director of a bank, you were responsible for the debts of the bank if it went under. And so you, you didn't just think about putting your capital up. 
thought about, you know, you made sure those loans would be carefully scrutinized, and you made sure that the information that, that uh, a borrower sent to you was, uh, was you know, as accurate as it could be. You didn't just, you know, originate a loan and then send it into by the Internet or some other way, send it into some faceless pool to be securitized, to be sold, to, to be bought by some investor who didn't really understand what he was buying. That wasn't the way the world worked. So we have to go, I think, back towards a, a more si a simpler uh, situation where uh, it, true information is shared, where there are serious penalties <coughs> for omitting material facts or providing false information, not, a, not simply on loan requests, but, but on annual uh, information circulated to shareholders, et cetera, by governments, to governments, et cetera. We need to change that whole approach. Uh, we've been embracing a culture where it's okay to deceive you. That, that just absolutely has to change. And as to making, as to separating the investment decision, investment banking from the commercial banking, uh, uh, you know, maybe history has shown that bigger is not better, and maybe history tells us that we should we should not necessarily go back to Glass Siegel itself, but uh, adopt legislation that uh, goes. Um, closer to the directions we'd all like to see, where investors know what they're buying, where people who are selling us stuff, you know, required to tell us the true underlying condition, uh, whether the uh, it's an asset or a security or whatever, or whatever it is they want to sell us, and uh, where when 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 the worst happens, when there's fraud, people pay serious penalties for fraud, whether they're in government, outside government, uh, in banking, outside banking, whatever. We need to we need to really adjust the system of checks and balances, put some firepower behind the regulators, give the people in the regulatory uh, apparatus a chance to come closer to playing on the, a level playing field. You know, when a big company like GE gets in trouble uh, or a big bank, they can hire you know more lawyers than the government can ever throw at a situation. So you have to. I think we, there's a, the system of checks and balances needs to change profoundly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree with that. It really does. And uh, your your comment, and I think Bob feels the same way, uh, is that uh, we need to have people be responsible for decisions. And if uh, uh, big banks and, and big organizations make bad decisions, they need to have uh, some way to be held responsible for those bad decisions. No more... Uh, too big to fail. I, you know, and Bob, uh, you referred to this a little bit earlier, or no, I guess Charles did. But the fact is, uh, you know, the uh, part of the bailout that the taxpayers did to uh, save the banks that are too big to fail, one of the first things they did was pay out a huge bonus uh, to Goldman Sachs and some of the banks who had made these messes in the first place. A uh, big bonus to some of their uh, their top uh, officers in those banks, and that's ridiculous. Uh, you know, why would somebody want to reward somebody uh, who did a bad job and, in fact, uh, do it with taxpayer money? Uh, we're going to be getting running out of time here shortly, but uh, Bob, tell tell our listeners what you see as a solution. What do we need to do to make sure that President Trump is protected? Uh, what do we need to talk about as far as what the banks are doing uh, and how, to, how should our listeners approach uh, government uh, to make sure that uh, these things don't happen? Well, uh, William K. Black from the University of Missouri, Kansas City, Ph.D., J.D., is the number one white-collar crime expert in America. He has stated in his new economic perspectives that the sole reason, the primary reason... Bob, I hate to do this. I'm sorry, but it sounds like we're running out of time. Uh, it sounds like we're... Uh, Going into the end of the program, commercial break, I want to thank you and Charles both uh, for all your uh, important information uh, to our listeners, and I look forward to the next time we get a chance to have you guys back on the show. Okay. Thank you.